Again, my name is Dave Hansen. Uh, I'm a retired Lutheran pastor. I am not a historian. I'm not a sociologist. Um, but I became somewhat just interested in this whole question of how is it that the Christian movement grew? And, um, and just in the course of kind of thinking about some of that stuff and talking to some other folks, I was introduced um, a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, to a book that had been written by a sociologist by the name of Rodney Stark. And he has since uh, passed away. He, um, but he was, he, he basically spent his career looking at issues kind of surrounding how is it that this Christian movement came to be what it was? And um, as Father Wes and I were uh, talking about some things earlier this year, we kind of decided that you know this might be something that would be just of interest to to others of us, and and might also provoke some conversation. Um, not only about how did we get here, but maybe what do we do now from from, from here? And so, over these next couple of Sundays, uh, I hope this will be more of a conversation than just simply spewing out some facts, some of which we know pretty solidly, and others of which we're you know, kind of guessing at. Um, because, believe it or not, uh, records from two millennia ago are maybe not as extensive or exhaustive as we might uh, wish they, they would be. And this but, is pre Google. This is absolutely surprising. Oh my God! <laughs> it's hard to believe that anything could be, could be, could be pre Google. No, but, 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 and things that we kind of take for granted. Is, you know, gosh, there are statistics on this and that. You know, there are great statistics about a lot of things, but not necessarily the things we're looking for. But maybe we should begin um, first with a uh, with a word of prayer. And so, we, if you would pray with me. Lord God, we, um, we come before you in gratitude for the gift of this day, um, but gratitude too for uh, the legacy that has been trusted to us by our forebears in faith. And as we talk about and learn about and explore some of the earliest movements of this Christian movement, may we be reminded that your Holy Spirit continues to be with us. We pray for the guidance of that spirit this day. And always. Amen. So, you kind of go back and you think about, let's just call it the year 30. And here we've got this Jesus um, who is at this point, I mean, he, in this carpenter's son, he, we, we think he had a little bit of a trade. And Presumably about the time he turned 30, all of a sudden, things began to happen. And we know for, I mean, one thing we know for sure is that the very first Christians were very few in number. And if we were to look at, and if, excuse me for just a second here, I'm going to go to, make sure I have my notes. That would be a good thing. <laughs> um, that would be a Well, and I do that a lot. Okay, we'll try this. Um, if we were to whip out our Bibles, then we're not going to do that right now. How about that? But if we were to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Why? There you go. You, did you write this? <laughs> <laughs> He's got kind of a teacher's pet thing going nowhere about it. <laughs> and, and, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And in the boat with their father Zebedee mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Okay, so we've gone from one to four, or five. And it's still a pretty small number. And um, then we know, um, we read a little bit further on in, in, in Matthew, and then Jesus summoned his, by this time, 12 disciples, 
and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And then he, so he had his 12. And Simon, Peter, I mean, we go on. And then we get to, uh, I mean, we know that we read earlier this summer here about Jesus appointing 70. Okay, so Jesus is kind of gathering. There, there are more people who are understanding a little bit, but emphasis probably on little, who this Jesus is. And then we get to after Jesus had been crucified, rose from the dead, and 40 days is what we understand. Um, we read in the first chapter of Acts that they, the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is where Jesus had been raised into heaven, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of, of James, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. Okay. So here we are, <coughs> crucified, risen, and now ascended Lord, and you can kind of almost imagine, I mean, put yourself among those 120 folks, and you say this Messiah that we had followed, and whom we have seen raised from the dead and now ascended, and he says, now, kind of look around at one another, and you say, now what do we do? <laughs> Well, they'd been told that they needed to wait and that the Spirit would come to them. And we know that on that first Pentecost, I mean, we, the story we all know well, but as of tongues of fire, and they were talking in words that at least those who had gathered around them, and we need to remember that at this point, they were all Jews. I mean, this was not the Gentiles. They, these were all Jews who had come from all around the Mediterranean, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But they were astounded, right, that they heard these people speaking in their own languages. They could, they could understand. And we know that after that extraordinary sermon that was delivered by, uh, by Peter, that at the end, and now when they, this is Acts chapter 2, um, when they, that is, those who had gathered and heard Peter, heard all this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Well, that's a pretty good... I don't know. I know. Brother if you ever... <laughs> no, not quite. Close, but... That's... And I'm, I'm still waiting. I, I... Well, and so then... They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And this sounds, we could spend a whole morning talking about what that might mean. But awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, listen to this, day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That there was something here that was moving and gaining traction.
crash. We will move a little bit further on in Acts. Peter and John were speaking to the people, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. And why is that? Because many who heard the word, and they numbered about 5,000. So, more people. The book of Acts, we also now tells us something about the Apostle Paul. And one of the things we know about Paul is that he was um, he kind of half passport, will travel. I mean, this man, I mean, we don't know for sure, but the um, presumption is that Paul may have traveled as much as 10,000 miles over the course of his missionary um, kind of activities. And when you think about it, 10,000 miles, when it's all by foot or by, um, uh, and as you can see, a lot also by, by boat. I mean, this is Paul's first. I mean, there are four trips that we um, learn about. Um, I mean, this is the first time that, that Paul crossed over to, into Europe, and we had the first converts in Europe, Lydia, who was um, there in, in Philippi. Um, and then finally, Paul's last journey, and that, as we know, ends in Rome and with his, um, and, and with his death. Um, but fascinating uh, kind of speculation about where Paul really intended to go beyond this. And that there is some thought that Paul, kind of, his next idea was that he was going to go to, um, to what we think of today as Spain. That, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how all of that um, would be possible. But the bottom line is here, by the early in the second century, that would be kind of in the say, 110, 120. So 100 years after Jesus' um, crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, there were, we know that there were Christian communities scattered around, certainly, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, with very large concentrations in, um, certainly still in the, in what we think of today as Palestine, but very much so in kind of the western part of what we think of today as, as Turkey, um, into Greece, and also here into the, kind of the southern part of, of, of Italy. And by the middle of the third century, so that would be around 250-ish, um, the concentration, the, the darker areas, and you can see that also on your, and maybe easier for you to read there, but I mean, as far west as kind of the Atlantic Ocean, but North Africa and Southern Europe, large concentrations in what we think of today as Tunisia, but Carthage, um, um, and this is the place from uh, whence uh, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo uh, came, uh, but all across the northern part of Africa, and again, Turkey, and a lot of a lot of Christians. I don't have things exactly mapped out, kind of year by year, because it doesn't. I mean, the data don't kind of allow that. But at the end of the second century, so that would be around the year uh, 200. Um, the population of Rome was estimated to be around 70,000 people. And the number of Christians, perhaps 7,000. So even though, I mean, we're really proportionally, I mean, this is, these are kind of, that's kind of, say maybe one in 10. But the population of the Roman Empire as a whole, and, and the Roman Empire was kind of all around like this, um, that was perhaps 60 million people. And the presumption is that even by the I mean, beginning part of you know, kind of the year 200, maybe one percent of the population was um, was Christian. And we know though that the Roman Church was at least relatively strong, because uh, they seem to have been rather active supporters of Christian communities elsewhere, and that would be very much following in Paul's um, kind of call to the church in Corinth. That, um, that they should be sure to 
be generous just as others had been generous in remembering, as Paul called them, the saints. And those would be the people in Jerusalem. The, um, and that Paul had sent some of his disciples, apostles, if you will, who were with him to make sure that they collected this offering, if you will, so that um, those who were in need would, in fact, be, uh, be cared for. But the thing is, by early in the 5th century, so that would be year 400, the Christian footprint in the Mediterranean basin and all through what we think of today as Western Europe, so North Africa uh, and, and actually going quite, quite far south into what we think of uh, today more as Ethiopia and that, um, and we Coptic Christians, you maybe have heard, I mean, that's a kind of, the, kind of more in here, but heavily, heavily Christian all around here, and at this point also as trade routes to towards China were open. I mean, there, there were a lot of their movement that way as well, and even here in India, and uh, we think they're the, uh, the Thomas Church, uh, which continues to this day. I mean, this is... Uh, yeah. Dave, I'm sorry, but no. um, do I assume that this, the color variations are the Kind of density? intensity, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we get to this, and there are some people who had said, oh gosh, you know, when Constantine converted to Christianity, I was after his mother, and blah, blah, blah. And early in the 300s, that that must have meant that was, that was the deal. But in fact, the persecutions by Constantine's immediate predecessors had largely failed, because by then Christianity had become so widely embedded within communities within the, the empire. And in fact, um, there was something called the Edict of Milan that kind of gave Christians the ability to, to pray and to do things. But in truth, that was simply recognizing reality. And it simply said, to, the Romans said to other, or to non, kind of, those who were not worshiping the Roman gods, that, okay, the deal is, just pray to your god for the safety and security of the empire, and you're okay. If you're going to pray to your god for that, we're not going to go after you. So it would seem that by the time we get to the fourth century, when you start from the fact that we had Jesus, and then Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John. And by the time, Christianity must have grown by something like 40% per decade. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty big number. Yeah. That's a pretty big number. And... It's almost like a wildfire. Well... <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it yeah. is. It is. And if we go back 120 years or so, there's a German historian by the name of Adolf Harnack um, called it just inconceivable rapidity and an astonishing expansion. And St. Augustine himself, about this time, said Christianity must have reproduced itself by means of miracles. For the greatest miracle of all would have been the extraordinary extension of the religion apart from any miracles. But one of the things that this guy figured out is that actually, yes, a lot of things contributed to it, but this is entirely plausible. And this is not to deny for a nanosecond, at least on my part, the workings of God in and through the Holy Spirit, in and through the lives of people like you and me. But we can look at certain things that maybe allowed this and encouraged all of this to happen. But first I'd like to take a look at at least one sociologist, and again, this is not a, this is not an evangelist writing. This is simply a sociologist. 
He says that conversion is not about seeking or embracing an ideology. It is about bringing one's religious behavior into alignment with that of one's friends and family members. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. I guess part of, one of the things that, um, one of the lines that a uh, pastoral colleague of mine used to say is that it's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. If you say, yeah. I mean, just think about it. I can speak from very personal experience. If I say, I'm going to go on a diet, and I'm going to lose 10 pounds, is that going to happen? How, how does that, what, what am I going to do when I get to dinner tonight? Oh gosh, that looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's far easier.